So this is quite a pleasure for me to be here to give a webinar on nanomedicine in the time of uh, COVID-19. And I just need to start off by thanking uh, the National Academy of Inventors because as we all know, these are very difficult times. I know in the survey that uh, everyone filled out, a lot of people were affected by work. That was the number one category of how COVID-19 has affected you. Same with me, I'm, I'm at my home <laughs> here. Um, and anything that can help scientists get together to talk about research, I think is not only good for research, but it's good for the mind too, and good for social interaction. So I applaud um, the National Academy of Inventors to continue to put on these webinar series and continue to have us discuss things. So this afternoon, I'm uh, gonna talk a little bit about uh, COVID research that has been going on um, in my uh, companies that have formed from licensing some technology. So of course, right off the bat, I wanna give some disclosures since I'll be talking about that research over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. But I wanna start at the very beginning, you know, because sometimes I think like everybody, I wake up in the middle of the night and wonder what in the world is going on today? And, and how did this ever happen? You know, I was walking around our neighborhood uh, yesterday and thinking a year ago, none of us had an idea that this COVID-19 would be right on our doorstep, would shut down governments, um, would still be creating trouble today, um, months after it first came to the United States and certainly after it came to different parts of the world. So I think this really begs our attention to think about how did we get here? And, and of course, if we can understand how we got here, we can keep this from happening in the future. And I know that's a tough thing to think about because this pandemic is not over. I was uh, seeing a, a post from CNN that the United Kingdom has just re-implemented restrictions. So for anybody that thought we're out of COVID-19, we are not but it's important for us to go backwards in order to go forwards. So something I've been talking about, and I know my colleagues in the biomaterials era have been talking a lot about our traditional problems in our healthcare system. And believe me, this is not a political statement by any means. This is a scientist view on global healthcare. And to me, it is quite clear, and I think to many people, it is quite clear that the traditional problems in our healthcare system, no matter where you are in the world, have just been exacerbated. They've just been highlighted. They've been um, exaggerated by COVID-19. Um, we knew that we had global problems with our old fashioned hospital system. So the first bullet that I have up there is overwhelmed hospitals. This was happening before COVID-19, perhaps not in some wealthy countries, but certainly in some poor countries, the infrastructure of a kind of brick and mortar type building that we call a hospital, which is where you go to get all of your health care, had problems. I think certainly we have seen around the world where temporary hospitals have to be built, um, tactical shelters, really new infrastructure to deal with the overwhelming people that were getting diagnosed and had uh, problems with COVID-19. Now, of course, and this existed before COVID-19, but it's even more so now, that second bullet, that many people have barriers to enter a hospital in the first place and think of the trouble that those people are encountering now when they know that's where people are going to get treated for a pandemic. If you already had a fear of germs and of viruses, you're really having a severe problem now to go into a hospital or doctor's visit. But I would remind people, you know, there were surveys done before COVID-19 that looked at race, ethnicity, sex, um, the education level, and highlighted that in all these populations, in all these subcategories, 
there were barriers for people to go in for healthcare. There was a different barrier for somebody who was like me, a close to 50 year old Caucasian male to go seek help if I feel like I'm having a heart murmur versus somebody else who might um, be more susceptible to go in for healthcare. So there were already barriers for people to go into a traditional healthcare setting. I would also emphasize this third bullet that um, again, even before COVID-19, our healthcare system, in, in my opinion, and I know I'll, I'll probably offend some of my pharmaceutical science friends, uh, we had an overdependency on drugs. Um, even now, we're in this waiting game for a vaccine. You know, I, I, sometimes I feel like, and I hope this doesn't sound harsh, that we're just waiting for a treatment, a vaccine to be developed. And that's why we're hunkering down. That's why governments have shut down. So I think that that's a problem in our healthcare system. And I think you could look at a lot of things. You could look at opioid addiction. You can look at antibiotic resistant bacteria. You can look at a system where drugs have helped but there's also a significant downfall of using drugs to fix all of our healthcare problems. And the list goes on and on, and I'm sure you can add to this too, but you know, I believe our problem is treating every patient the same. We've seen this with COVID-19, that it interacts differently on age, on uh, populations, it interacts differently. So a healthcare system that has kind of a cookie cutter type uh, prescription and way of dealing with people, I think, is also a problem. It needs to be much more personalized. And of course, our medicine is largely reactionary and not predictive. So I, I you know, obviously, if we want to decrease costs, if we want to have a better efficacy in our healthcare system, we have to do a better job of predicting your problems before they turn into an overwhelming healthcare problem for you and for the healthcare system. So you know, many years ago, a lot of people in my personal case, this was about 25 years ago, we started looking at nanomaterials. And we started looking at nanomaterials for, for so many reasons. We looked at nanomaterials because they're small, because they can penetrate tissues, they can penetrate cells where micron particles cannot. We looked at nanoparticles to avoid immune system clearance so that you could deliver a drug or deliver a treatment um, more effectively using that particle. We also looked at nanotextures on implants as a way to mimic the natural nanostructure topography of our tissues or of things in nature like insect wings. All of that rationale really provided some reason to look at this field in medicine and, and really what we found out and what we're finding out, still learning about these fascinating materials in my mind, is that they have very special properties, very special energy to interact with proteins, with cells, with viruses, very interesting mechanical properties, catalytic, electrical properties, all of these things that become very important for medicine. And we have a history, like many people do, we're not alone in looking at nanostructured surfaces or nanotextures for improving currently implanted medical devices. And our approach has been to really do this without drugs. Can we create nanotextures that can improve tissue growth, that can reduce infection, that can reduce or inhibit scar tissue formation or inflammation in your body? And you know the, the jury's still out, we're still collecting this information and data, but we are seeing some very positive signs that I've highlighted on, on this slide. And certainly I don't have time to go through all of these things, but just quickly, you know, taking spinal cages, um, working with a company called HD Life Sciences to implement nanoscale features on these spinal cages can improve bone growth and can decrease infection without using a drug. For amputees, we've been working uh, with a company called NanoV, a spin-out company that has been using anodization as a way to create nanoscale features on titanium that can be used to close an amputee wound for an osseointegrated device, to close that skin that you can see here in a rat study that we conducted to keep bacteria from crawling down that screw and infecting bone and increasing 
soft tissue as well as hard tissue growth to fixate that screw so that an amputee device can stably fit on top. We've also seen down here in the lower corner that nano features on polymers can promote things like vascular cell attachment, endothelial cell attachment. This is critical for stent applications to keep your inflammatory cells from recognizing that material as foreign and beginning to recreate some kind of tissue that would clog that uh, artery. We've also seen catheters that you can nanotexture catheters or endotracheal tubes to have nano features to limit bacteria attachment like Staphylococcus epidermidis shown here. And you know, the list goes on and on. We've created nano textured features on orthopedic implants to improve tendon and ligament attachment. We've looked at biodegradable metals like magnesium oxide, create nano textures on those surfaces to control cell events. But as much as I love that research, <laughs> and it's been a big part of my career so far, obviously this is not a webinar and the, about uh, nano texturing for tissue growth. And it's quite honestly, not even forefront on my mind. What is forefront on my mind and has been for quite a while is can these same approaches show any use in treating COVID-19? Can they be used? Can nanoparticles be used? Can nanotextures be used to help prevent and diagnose and of course, importantly, treat symptoms from COVID-19? But I do have to say, Again, we should all take a step back and really look at, you know, we should have seen this coming. There are so many examples for, you know, as just a couple of viruses that have created problems, maybe not as big of a problem as today in the United States, but certainly Asia has had a very difficult time with certain viruses. And, and they knew to wear masks a long time ago, yet we're still having a debate, you know, about wearing masks. So viruses like MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, norovirus, Zika virus, which was a, a huge problem in Brazil, uh, you might remember. So, you know, there's a new virus that comes along and mutates, um, emerges into our society, into our healthcare system every so often. So there will be another, you know, when we get past, or maybe we won't get past this COVID-19 before another virus, uh, you know, mutates and enters the uh, human healthcare system. And, and I would also remind people, we have another huge problem coming up with antibiotic resistant bacteria. You know, here in the US, the Centers for Disease Control created this pie chart. Well, I guess it's not, I don't know if that's a pie chart or just a circle chart, but they predicted that purple region, that more people will die from antimicrobial resistance by 2050, then the next largest, all cancers combined. You know, so we're getting closer and closer, 30 years away from this prediction of uh, huge problems with antibiotic resistance. So, you know, we know these things existed, we know that they present problems, but yet, and, and again, I hate to sound so, so harsh because our healthcare system has done so much good over the years, but our approaches to these things have really not significantly changed. You know, our approaches, despite these problems, have really stayed the same. You know, and, and again, I, I feel like we're in this waiting game for a vaccine to save us all. Um, but shouldn't we have some better platform technology, something that every new virus that comes along, we can simply tweak an approach that's worked in the past to help us with therapy or to help us deal with a new virus or for antibiotic resistant bacteria? Shouldn't we have an approach that doesn't rely on antibiotics, you know, relies on a different way to kill bacteria? And clearly, you know, you can see the problem in particular with this approach. I think we all see the problem with waiting for a vaccine right now. Um, I'm in my, <laughs> I'm in my, my house as an example. And people certainly, um, unfortunately, over 200,000 people now in the U.S. have died from uh, this waiting for a vaccine. 
So if for antibiotic resistant bacteria, of course, we know that there are bacteria resistant to conventional antibiotics and they've mutated around those antibiotics and now are very difficult, um, if, if, if not impossible, to kill. So um, we do know that there's a decreasing pipeline for FDA approved antibiotics. So we really need to change our thinking you know, for viruses, for bacteria, for some of these consistent problems in our healthcare system. And so of course, you know, this was before COVID-19, we started thinking, could nanoparticles, could nanotechnology be used as a way to prevent virus spreading? Could it be used as a way to uh, diagnose viruses and as therapy? And, you know, it might not surprise you, there has been a lot of work going on over the years. It may not be highlighted, and it may not be stated as nanotechnology, but there has been a lot of work in this area, which, which is encouraging. We still need a lot more to push it into the commercialization world, but clearly why we looked at nanomaterials in the first place is because SARS-CoV-2, which leads to the, the disease COVID-19, is nanostructure, right? All viruses have nanostructured properties, whether you think about the diameter, or the, the, the functionalities, the active regions on those viruses, they're all nanostructured. And we also know that viruses have multiple functionalities at the nanometer regime. So these S proteins, spike proteins that are used, the red region down here in this cartoon, the green up here in this cartoon, those of course are the regions that attach to a mammalian cell and then the virus gets in and replicates. So clearly those S proteins are nanostructured entities. They have nanostructured spacing, they have nanostructured lengths and, and diameters. So there's a lot of nanostructured dimension that could render somebody to think about using nanomaterials to get in there, to attach to these regions, to really keep that virus from functioning the way uh, it wants to, to, to replicate. We also know the third bullet down here that like all proteins, natural materials, there is a limited ability for these viruses to withstand heat. And the last thing, you know, of course we know, uh, there's more things we know, but the, the last thing I've listed on this slide is that there is a lipid region for these viruses that uh, can be disrupted. And they can be disrupted by reactive oxygen species. So for those of you that know anything about nanotechnology, hopefully there's some bells that are starting to go off <laughs> in your brain. Of course, something that's nanostructured, you can use a nanoparticle, nanomaterial to deal with it. But also, if you're familiar with nanotechnology, and I think the next um, webinar from NAI will be on gold nanoparticles. And yes, I, I have nanoparticles at home. <laughs> Here's some gold nanoparticles that I have right here by my computer you know they can heat up through near infrared. So if you can get that gold nanoparticle to attach to the virus, use near infrared to heat up, to disrupt that virus, that's a potential therapy. And you know, the last bullet, you of course know if you work with nanomaterials, they have very high surface to volume ratios and some of the chemistries are very good about producing reactive oxygen species and a lot of reactive oxygen species because they have this high surface to volume ratio. So here's an example or more reasons, you know, really that I think looking at nanoparticles in particular are useful for uh, COVID-19 and quite frankly, all viruses. And, and I'll show you another nanoparticle that I happen to have sitting here. It's pictured in the SEM picture to the left, the SEM pictures to the left and it's cerium oxide. So it kind of looks like milk, but cerium oxide is an excellent chemistry that changes its ability to produce or accumulate reactive oxygen species depending on pH. And also the thing that intrigues me about not just cerium oxide, but a lot of nanoparticles is we have, as a field, we have progressed beyond making spherical smooth nanoparticles, but now making nanoparticles that have facets, that have junctures, that can come out. 
And you can see where this could be helpful in, in a coronavirus that has spike proteins. If you have complementary dimensional regions that can fit in between these spike proteins and attach to the spike proteins, you're now thinking of a, of a much better way to deactivate that virus. So certainly all of these attractive properties that nanoparticles that researchers all around the world over the past several decades have noticed in nanoparticles that stem from their high surface to volume, high surface area to volume ratio can definitely help in terms of preventing uh, diagnosing and treating um, COVID-19. So just some more reasons, and I have some more pictures, you know, of these nanoparticles that people are making for many applications. Um, I think the, the next webinar on gold will talk a lot about cancer and how gold nanoparticles have really helped um, photothermal properties heat up and, and kill cancer cells. Same, again, idea here, but we've learned through the, the decades that nanoparticles are very easy to functionalize. You know, as long as you reduce that agglomeration that is a disadvantage of using nanoparticles, you can put certain functional regions that will attract the uh, nanoparticle to SARS-CoV-2, or again, any virus. We of course know that they can be made out of dietary elements. So, you know, here's an example of selenium that I have right here. You can see agglomerated selenium nanoparticles on the, the bottom there. Selenium is part of your natural diet. And although you don't need much of it in your natural diet, it can boost your immune system. And there's a lot of studies showing what happens if you have reduced amount of selenium to your immune system. So you can think about using these nanoparticles made of natural healthy elements to not only disrupt the virus attachment to a mammalian cell, but then as it degrades, it can boost your immune system by releasing some, some uh, elements necessary as part of your, your diet. I already talked about the external control of heat to uh, destroy vir uh, viral structure. The other thing we have learned through the years, of course, is because of their size, these particles are very easy to aerosolize. So if you think about a lung infection, where COVID-19 presents a lot of symptoms, what a, a, a better material than one that's easy, aerosolized, could be inhaled, go directly to the virus um, that's in your, your lung system. I'm, I'm gonna skip this video that I have because it has sound. <laughs> and, um, and I think I'm also over time, uh, I'm running low on time. So if you wanna see a silly little video on all how nano, materials are being used to deactivate uh, COVID-19, I encourage you to, to look at that. Okay, so let's just briefly talk, and of course, I don't have a lot of time to go in depth in any of these areas, but prevention, diagnosis, and therapy. And the prevention um, part has seen a lot of activity. And I think, you know, as a chemical engineer, I've known what PP is, PPE is for a long time. <laughs> But uh, now it's part of everybody's common nomenclature uh, where nanoparticles are being used um, to protect us. So there are, there, is a, there are companies, there's one called Synovia that um, uh, makes a mask that is using zinc uh, nanoparticles. Um, and uh, they, I believe, were making it before COVID-19 as a way to reduce bacteria growth, um, so as a way to keep you from spreading uh, bacteria to another patient, and some of the same reasons, not all of the same reasons, but some of the same reasons that can kill bacteria can also disrupt viruses like reactive oxygen species, like elevated heat, for example. So in, in these examples, um, there are studies reporting that zinc uh, nanoparticles or when zinc is, is combined into a mask, it can produce reactive oxygen species. If you happen to cough and a moisture drop comes out with COVID-19 on it, they um, have shown that uh, the mechanism of action via uh, reactive oxygen species to destroy the virus, and they have you know, some information, I refer you to their, their website if you're interested on um, that, uh, that efficacy that's been tested in not my lab, but in other, other people's labs. Of course, that same idea of using nanoparticles with gloves 
is being um, tested and manufactured. There are also approaches um, in which you can spray everyday surfaces to keep a virus from either absorbing or if it does absorb, deactivates that virus. And again, one of those chemistries, selenium, has shown a lot of promise spraying a surface, having those nanoparticles precipitate after spray on my computer keyboard that I'm looking at right now, where if a virus a moisture droplet comes out and wants to absorb the selenium chemistry, actually has an ability for reactive oxygen species generation to keep that um, virus from being active. There are also approaches with UV light that you might be aware of were TiO2 nanoparticles on surfaces. TiO2 can be activated by UV light. Again, high surface area from a nanoparticle allows for that interaction with UV light to uh, keep COVID-19 from, from spreading or SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-2 from, from spreading. Another very simple way that people have been investigating that, again, this goes back to the tissue engineering medical device work that I talked about earlier, but if you have nanotextured surfaces, one of the things that the field has learned is nanotextured surfaces have much different surface wettability. And again, that has to do with increased surface area where you can now control moisture drops. So you can have a moisture drop ball up more or spread out more. And clearly, if there's a virus inside of there, that in turn will either inhibit its interaction or if the droplet spreads more, it would maximize its interaction. So you can use nanotextures on everyday metals used as doorknobs or polymers like um, polyurethane coatings on wood for, for work desks. For example, that people have highlighted nanotextures can really change that surface energy to um, minimize uh, virus attachment. And I briefly mentioned, you know, why these nanotextures seem to be working in this area. And you can have explanations that go from mimicking nature, right? So taking an insect wing, looking at it, knowing that an insect wing or a locust wing can reduce bacteria attachment and microbe attachment, virus attachment. Looking closely under high magnification, you see a lot of nano features on those surfaces. So you can start with explanations that are you know, too simple, I think, to mimic nature. And you can get more sophisticated, which is where we've been spending a lot of time looking at finite element analysis. So if you have a virus or you have a bacteria that's trying to attach to one of these surfaces, you can look at how the membrane is not flexible enough to really attach. And it serves like a bed of nails to keep that microbe um, uh, from attaching to a surface if created correctly. We also know, you know, when you have a, a virus in, in a droplet of moisture, when you cough, there are proteins in that saliva in, or in that uh, moisture drop that is coming out when you cough. We know that these nanotextured surfaces have a much different interaction with proteins. So for example, we know fibronectin as what's shown here under atomic force micrograph pictures, when fibronectin adsorbs to a nanostructured surface, you can see just a simple qualitative that it's more fibrillar, it's spread out. But when it's on a micron textured surface, it's more spherical. Those two different geometries will have different bioactivities to control that viral attachment to a surface. So again, we know that that surface energy change not changing the material itself, but changing the degree of nanotextures can influence protein interactions, which therefore can influence microbial attachment. And I don't have time to talk about this, but we've even generated an equation that if you had a material and you wanted to create a nanotexture to inhibit um, SARS-CoV-2 from absorbing, our equation will tell you what height, width, and length, it's based on computational models, will tell you what energy you can get from a certain height, width, and length to, um, to make that possible. And again, a lot of this comes from our tissue engineering work. So very quickly, uh, diagnosis is another key area where nanoparticles are being studied very heavily. And we all know the importance of diagnosis. In fact, I'm, you know, again, 
just amazed that, you know, however months we are into this uh, crisis, this pandemic, we don't have a diagnostic kit that can tell someone if they're positive within minutes. And that just totally still is incredible to me with all of the science and all of the knowledge that we have that we don't have a commercially available. And I know there's been successes and people are reporting that they're very close to this, but we don't have a, a kit that can be used at your home to keep you from going into a hospital, to keep you from going into a public place, a CVS, for example, to get a test and then have to wait 24 to 48 hours for a result. So whether you look at PCR tests for COVID-19, a serological test, which looks at the presence of antibodies, um, or you look at these rapid diagnostic tests where there's a lot of activity to create that fast test, accurate <laughs> fast test to tell you if you're, you're positive, nanomaterials are being used in every one of those, studied in every one of those to increase speed and sensitivity. And again, this came from a history of looking at nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles in particular for Zika detection, for Middle Eastern coronavirus detection. So this has come from previous viruses where gold nanoparticles, because of their high surface area, they have an, an enhanced um, surface plasma resonance effect that allows you to detect smaller quantities of these viruses that are present. And you know, just a real simple experiment, I'll show you my last nanoparticle here, iron oxide. So here's iron oxide, and clearly, if you take a magnet, and I'm not gonna get close to my computer, <laughs> but a magnet with um, iron oxide nanoparticles, and these particles have been functionalized to attach to a virus, you can clearly use a magnet to concentrate these iron oxide nanoparticles, which allow you to have a more concentrated solution of the virus if it's present in a solution that you're testing to enable for um, a faster, better assay. Lastly, uh, therapies. So um, in therapies too, you know, and I, I don't wanna sound overly excited, I have no connection with Moderna, but Moderna is a company that I think here in the US we're aware of, uh, has been um, undergoing clinical trials for their mRNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. This was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They are using a nanoparticle. It's a lipid-based nanoparticle for many of the reasons that I said before. Um, they're concentrating their approach on using a nanoparticle, and it, it's, it's, we're still waiting for a lot of the efficacy trials, but the safety trials looked pretty good. So, you know, that of course highlights how nanomedicine, nanomaterials, nanoparticles are being used on the vaccine front. On the therapy front, a lot of people are investigating these self-assembled materials. So let me, uh, let me look at the time. Yeah, so maybe just two more minutes to, to tell you about the promise of self-assembled materials that are being studied for SARS-CoV-2. Um, here's an example of one. Uh, there's, you know, as, as you probably know, self-assembled chemistries are chemistries you create that have hydrophobic regions, hydrophilic regions, and they self-assemble in bodily fluids in a controllable geometry. So here I'm showing these self-assemble into a fiber, but you can change the dimension concentration of these to end up with spheres uh, for self-assembled molecules. But clearly what you can do with these and what makes them so versatile is you can change the bioactive region that sticks out from these self-assembled chemistries. You can put on here regions that will attach to SARS-CoV-2 or put on regions that will attach to a bacteria. And that's where our work started as we developed a peptide uh, to put on these self-assembled chemistries that would kill MRSA and multi-drug resistant E. coli. So again, you put a, a region, a peptide on there that is attracted towards the MRSA methicillin resistant Staphylococcus uh, auroris um, membrane. And what we see is that it, it, it almost 
pokes, uh, it's like a sphere, a spear that pokes the MRSA membrane and causes um, bacteria death. Same thing with multi-resistant dr uh, multi drug resistant E. coli, where those self-assembled materials can attach to the membrane and then create death. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but here's a second self-assembled chemistry that I've been working with um, Professor Faneri at Northeastern, where you take DNA-based pairs, make a new molecule. Of course, these DNA-based pairs, guanine and cytosine, have complementary uh, electron acceptor and donor arrays. So in biological fluids, they will self-assemble by hydrogen bonds, here's six of them, and hydrogen bonds that join them together. Similar to that last self-assembled material that I talked about, these uh, types of lysine groups can be replaced with active regions that allow this self-assembled molecule to attach to uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, or you use these to attach to bone or cartilage cells and promote their growth. So here is an example of where we've been using the helical rosette nanotubes to heal bone. So the great thing about these self-assembled materials, not just the ones in my lab, but in other people's labs, is we usually have pretty good safety data on these already because we've been using them in tissue engineering. And here you can see on the bottom is the self-assembled material that is healing bone. And in fact, uh, the chemistry we created as part of the self-assembled material to degrade whenever proteins are produced during bone synthesis. Similarly, down here for cartilage, we've been using these self-assembled materials to heal cartilage, where we do get structures that mimic the different zones of cartilage, not fiber cartilage, which you would get as a repair mechanism for cartilage defect. The other thing about these self-assembled materials that, that I think are interesting is they show very, if, if created correctly, they can show very little inflammatory response. So could you also have a material that attaches to a virus, but then decreases the cytokine storm or the inflammatory response by not activating macrophages in monocytes? So I don't have too much time to talk about this, but here's our two materials, self-assembled materials, helical rosette nanotubes, we um, have been functionalizing them with regions to attach to SARS-CoV-2. You know, many people ask, how do we know what regions? And our microbiologists have done uh, a fascinating job. Our, the virologists have reported very early on the structure of COVID-19, of SARS-CoV-2. And here's the, one of the papers that was published back in March that showed the mutations in SARS-CoV-2 to create a novel, to say that it's a novel virus. So we've been using that information to design complementary peptide functionalities on these self-assembled molecules so that they can attach to the SARS-CoV-2 and really blanket it, keep it from attaching to a mammalian cell. And we've been using a lot of our early work was really in computational models. So I refer you to this nice website that um, is publicly available where you can type in certain chemistries and see what this force of attraction is between your molecule and SARS-CoV-2. What we're learning in our studies so far is that the functionalized multiple functional regions, not just going after the S protein, but going after the envelope protein. You know, a lot of proteins on the virus increases your strength of attachment to again, render blanket that virus to keep it from attaching to a mammalian cell and then replicating. So I don't have time to show you the movies, but here's some molecular dynamics <laughs> simulation where you can see we've taken some of our self-assembled molecules with PEG, polyethylene glycol to avoid immune system, and we've taken some very specific peptides to attach and see how well they interact, not only with the virus and bacteria, but also um, with mammalian cells, since it's a competition between our self-assembled material and a virus versus uh, having it attached to a mammalian cell. So I do want to leave with two last things, um, if you'll permit me the time. Uh, and the one last thing that I'm seeing a lot of activity in this viral area is, and, and all of nanoparticles, 
is getting away from using toxic chemicals. You know, when, when we make these gold nanoparticles, we do use, you know, uh, I wouldn't say highly toxic materials, but, but materials that we'd rather not use when making them. Catalysts, um, et cetera, you know, when making carbon nanotubes, uh, the old conventional thinking was to use cobalt. So how can we get away from using those toxic chemicals? And there's a whole field, and I think the next webinar will talk a little bit more about this, called green chemistry, green nanomedicine, where you can use living organisms to make these nanoparticles. So we are using bacteria themselves to make nanoparticles to kill multi-drug resistant bacteria. We're using cancer cells to make nanoparticles that can kill cancer cells and be selective about it. So the, the avoiding the use of using those toxic chemicals is great, but another thing that's really wonderful is that they seem to do better. These cell-made nanoparticles seem to outperform in many properties those made through conventional chemistry, and we, we believe the reason is because these particles have proteins adsorbed to them and from the cell that made it, and that helps target the particle to the cell that made it to kill it. So in other words, if we want to kill MRSA, but not the healthy E. coli in your intestine that helps your digestion, if we have MRSA make nanoparticles, they will have a protein coating that helps target that nanoparticle specifically to MRSA. So this is a very interesting approach that we're really trying to, not only for green technologies, but also for better efficacy. So I hope I did a, a decent job. I know it's difficult over a webinar to think about nanotechnology and how it can be used in prevention, diagnosis, and therapy. But I do hope that we take time and each reflect as a scientific community what we could have done better. And, and it's, it's not too late, but I think there's a lot of missteps that have occurred. And I'm not talking politics, I'm talking in the scientific community about a lack of roadmap to develop prevention, diagnostic, and improved therapies. I'm talking about a lack of global listening you know, listening to parts of the world that have dealt with severe viral outbreaks before and knowing the importance of PPE, of, of wearing masks. I think there is so much that we really need to learn and take and start implementing now, um, obviously to treat COVID-19, but also for the next pandemic. So I hope everyone stays healthy and, and uh, enjoy the, the webinar, or at least I got you to think about something. That was kind of the goal. <laughs> Acknowledgements for funding, and certainly my lab um, has been working hard on uh, strategies um, for using nanomedicine in this whole pandemic. Thank you uh, very much, and thank you for letting me go a couple of minutes over. Thank you, Tom. I know the audio is difficult to hear. Um, but I just want to thank you for a wonderful presentation and thank you to our attendees. We do have some time for a quick Q&A. So again, if you do have a question for Tom about the presentation or just about nanomedicine in general, feel free to use the chat feature or the Q&A function. Yeah. So, so sorry, Jade, I can't hear you, but I am on both <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> chat function as well as the Q&A function. So I could answer you know, a couple of these excellent um, questions that, that are on there. Um, you know, the, the, the important thing for, you know, all of these nanoparticles, I, I believe, you know, the two areas that are farthest along are certainly you can buy a mask today that has nanoparticles in it. So you can use those as a preventative measure. There have been questions asked about those kind of masks, but certainly in the PPE area, the surface texturing, that is pretty far along. And I think the therapy part, the Moderna and other, I didn't mean to just highlight Moderna, but there's some other companies that are doing a, a very good job in terms of um, using nanoparticles as a novel vaccine. So I, I think that that's a, an important um, component. So I love this question that is, how do we go about collaborations with testing in vivo? 
So I actually think, and you know, I, I always need to be careful not to sound uh, so pessimistic, but we struggled a lot with this in the very beginning, in March, when I heard from you know, Chinese colleagues, this was coming, wear your mask, be prepared. Um, we weren't <laughs> prepared. Um, we immediately wanted to get our hands on the structure of COVID-19, of SARS-CoV-2. We couldn't find it. Um, we went to you know, government agency websites. We could not find what the specific chemistry structure was, which is vital to an engineer like myself in order to develop a complementary chemistry that can attach to it. We also could not find even someone who could do an in vitro assay. All the universities at the time, they closed their labs. They slowly reopened labs that were working with COVID-19, but I, you know, not a smooth process. I don't know if there's other people at universities, but it took a while to get my lab back open, even though we had funding, we had ideas to um, deal with nanoparticles for SARS-CoV-2. So that was a delay. And then ultimately what the question's asking about in vivo. You know, we had a heck of a time finding somebody who could do an in vivo test. We contacted all the big hospitals in the United States who we knew had the capability and they were getting inundated. So that's what I talk about when I don't think we had a, and we still, I still don't think we have a national roadmap for treating COVID or diagnosing COVID. You know, really in my mind, the way you do this um, is, you know, here's a series of hospitals that can test the materials you're creating. You know, here's the collection of universities or companies that can make the materials. Here's the virologist that can give you the structure and constantly update on mutations which are occurring in SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, that roadmap, I, I don't, if you see it, please email it to me because I'd love to, to be part of that roadmap. But I think our approach here in the US, and again, I'm, I'm thankful for the funding and thankful for the opportunity, but it's been, you know, here's increased money you know, try to come up with a solution without that interconnection, without that collaboration. And I think that really hurts us. And it also hurts us that we didn't have that collaboration abroad either. We weren't learning scientifically, you know, take away the wearing of masks and things like that. We weren't really learning from our scientific colleagues in Iceland who um, quickly developed tools to deal with COVID-19. We didn't have those kinds of roadmaps, that strategic plan. And, and, and I'm sorry for that, you know, and I wish we get that together for the next uh, pandemic. So should I take one, one more, Jade? Yeah, one more. So um, uh, yeah, so the question, again, an excellent one. Um, we develop nanoparticles that target airway endothelial cells and deliver drugs into the cells. We have a test target specificity using A549 cells, uh, which are human lung epithelial cells. What do we do next? This, you know, great question. And this is, I think, where our problem is. <laughs> this highlights exactly what I'm saying, is where is our roadmap for all of these wonderful ideas? You know, I'm sure the nanoparticles that are being referred to in this question are, are worthy of testing. And there's many more that are worthy of testing, nanotechnology or not. And we really, we need that roadmap, you know. So the one thing that really helped me uh, move my research along was that a company came along interested in what I'm doing, quite honestly. I, I, we wouldn't have the results that we have today unless there was a private company that came in, licensed our approaches from Northeastern, and then developed it um, into a company. So through that, we've been able to make a lot of connections and really advance things. So, you know, I could certainly offer to help in any way that I can um, with new nanoparticles, especially those that can, can target epithelial cells and therefore potentially target the cells where the virus is entering and replicating, right? That's the, the value of those nanoparticles. So, um, so yes, 
So I hope we have that roadmap. And I'm really, you know, I, I don't know why we don't. You know, I, I, I have asked questions to all of our funding agencies, particularly the NIH, for leadership in, the, in that area. Um, but please feel free to contact me privately and I can help uh, where I can. So thank you, Jade. Um, I appreciate everybody's attention. Please keep on going. You know, we are not done. As I mentioned before, things are, are we're, we're having another spike here, you know, and we are not done with this pandemic. So the science is nowhere near where it needs to be. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, I just want to close out the session by, um, again, encouraging you all to reach out to Tom Webster via the um, websites he provided or email. We'd be happy to share some additional materials as well. This recording will be available on the NAI YouTube channel for future watch. And again, thank you all for attending this session. We do have another session, as Tom alluded to, on October 8th which will feature um, University of Missouri, Dr. Katesh Katsi, who will discuss the revolutionary methodology of non-toxic gold nanoparticle technology. So in alignment with what we discussed here today. Um, and so if you can just attend, we appreciate all of your support thus far and wish you a, an enjoyable day and the rest of the week. So thank you all, have a good, have a good day.